Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, our listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Carmine Bailey, Vince Power, Chris Benito, and a brand new patron, Gray Wolf. Awoo! <laughs> On this episode of DTNS, Universal and TikTok are making up and bringing UMG's music back to the platform. The US versus Google trial reveals some big speed energy. And is Europe behind in tech? This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, May 2nd, 2024. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. From deep in the heart of Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm producing the show today. I'm Amos, and that is Roger. Hello. <laughs> I will disappear now. <laughs> just, you know, you, 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 you take, take a few things out of the equation of what we do every day, and we're all like, where am I? Flawless. Who am I? What Flawless. day is it? We got is it there going tech on. news? Well, there is tech news. Uh, we're good at that, at least. So let's get into it, starting with the quick hits. A lawsuit filed Wednesday by the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University on behalf of researcher Ethan Zuckerman, an associate professor at the Unity, University of Massachusetts Amherst, argues that U.S. law requires that Meta must let people use unofficial add-ons or extensions to have more control over their social feeds. This is part of an ongoing debate over tools that give users extra privacy options or that collect research data. Zuckerman's suit specifically wants to prevent Facebook from blocking a new browser extension for Facebook that he works on called Unfollow Everything 2.0, which would let users more easily unfollow friends and groups and pages on the service, taking them out of a user's newsfeed altogether. That might sound uh, familiar to you. Yeah, in 2021, British developer Lewis Barclay created the original tool Unfollow Everything, and he was eventually permanently banned from the platform. Eurogamer reports that PlayStation is removing Horizon Zero Dawn Complete Edition from the PlayStation Plus catalog on May 21st. This also includes the Frozen Wilds expansion, in case you were wondering. Horizon Zero Dawn will continue to be a PlayStation 4 game. It's still playable on the PS5 with a 60 FPS update, but doesn't have a native version. Microsoft is rolling out passkey support for all consumer accounts today after enabling them in Windows 11 last year. Now, Microsoft account owners can also generate passkeys across Windows, Android, and iOS, letting them sign in to a Microsoft account without having to type in that pesky password every time. Apple is making a, a few tweaks to core technology fee that can affect iOS developers in the European Union in accordance with the Digital Markets Act. Developers of free apps can now avoid the fee entirely, and devs with annual global revenue under 10 million euros get a three-year free on-ramp, essentially a pay-later solution. CTF remains opt-in for iOS developers in the EU as Apple continues to offer its standard business terms, but the CTF covers things like allowing sideloadings of apps, third-party app stores, and support for alternative payment tech in other than Apple's own. It also must agree to the set of business terms that Apple has laid out. Bloomberg reports that Take-Two Interactive has shut down two indie-sized studios under its umbrella. UK developer Roll7, known for Ollie Ollie, the franchise, and Rollerdome, and Seattle-based studio Intercept Games, behind Kerbal Space Program 2. Wednesday, GamesIndustry.biz reported a warn notice that was filed in Washington state that the Take-Two-owned Seattle office would close this June and affect 70 employees. There are other reports of other employees being affected as well. Both Roll2 and Intercept are part, are part of Take-Two's indie game private division. Okay, let's talk about Universal Music Group and TikTok making up and playing nice. Uh, they've ended their standoff over royalty payments and also AI policies. We'll get to that in a second. The companies announced that they've struck a deal to bring Universal's music library back to TikTok's platform. If you're on TikTok in any capacity, you might have noticed or you might have seen people complain that either songs that they wanted to use were no longer available or actually stripped out of uh, the stuff that they had posted in the past. So the agreement includes TikTok delivering improved uh, remuneration for UMG's songwriters and artists, new promotional and engagement opportunities for their recordings and songs, 
and industry leading protections with respect to generative AI. The companies say they'll work on new monetization opportunities, utilizing TikTok's growing e-commerce capabilities, and will work together on campaigns supporting UMG's artists across genres and territories globally. That's a lot of just corporate speak stuff. But Justin, it does sound like the two companies have agreed to financial terms, whatever they might be. But it also sounds a lot like UMG needed TikTok to better protect its artists against AI tools. Sarah, the way I see it, there are three big parts of this deal. Starting at number three, money. Number two, money. <laughs> what? what? How is money not number one? But okay, uh, all right. Oh, no, no, uh, sorry. Three is you, money. you spoiled it. Money <laughs> is also number one. That's all this was about. Uh, 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 okay. Uh, we, we're, we're, we're in a market where we don't have MTV. We don't have radio. The way that music which historically has seen sales be driven by the youth market the way that they get in front of those users these days are social media apps it's youtube and tiktok primarily if you look at the trends so universal is not in a position where if they can make as much money as possible they are going to do it they're they're not there to give away the music for free but you know, the, the, the AI stuff I, I think is is fascinating because I wonder, they don't spell out exactly what these safeguards are. I suspect that they are more of a favored nation status, that there is somebody they can call if they believe there is uh -huh. a yeah. universal artist uh, uh, that is like an AI song that they cannot monetize is being used on that platform, that they have a way to get it pulled. But you know, get in line with uh, a bunch of people that want to have more influence over the TikTok algorithm, up to and including the federal government. You know, this is probably me showing my age and also just the fact that I'm more of a consumer than a creator on TikTok for sure. Um, and, you know, a lot of content creation uh, apps at, at this point. But, you know, for when I when when this Universal Music Group's uh, music library first got pulled from TikTok, I was like, eh, I mean, you have other songs, just pick another song. But this is very, very important uh, to a lot of creators. You know, you want to have your finger on the pulse. You want to have the cool song, you know, the biggest artist, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, putting the fact that, yeah, they could choose another song aside. It's like it's it, this was inevitable for UMG and TikTok to just figure something out get back to the, you know, to the table and, you know, shake hands, make a deal. The AI stuff, you know, like you, like you were saying is, is more, uh, interesting. And also, yeah, it's, it's not very clear what TikTok is going to do besides, yeah. Universal just being like, take down notice time and TikTok saying, I will press that button. You got it. <laughs> you know, you got it rather than going through some, you know, rigmarole, which probably was, already an issue with Universal where, uh, you know, they were they were trying to hold TikTok's feet to the fire, so to speak, to say, like, well, I, we're not going to come back unless you give us more control. And I would imagine that there's probably some kind of parameters that would seem reasonable for stuff like that. Like, if you have an AI-created song that is obviously inspired by a Universal artist, then that's harder to get pulled down. Mm -hmm. But if you have a song that purports to be from one of those artists in fact you know we're, we're going to talk a little bit later in, in gdi about there's there's right now a very very exciting rap beef between kendrick lamar and drake <laughs> each time that one of them releases a song there are ai songs that purport to be the response to it if that goes viral on tiktok I would assume that the record label for either Kendrick Lamar or or Drake would want to be able to say, no, pull that. We don't, we can't monetize that. We don't want to confuse the market by that being a thing if it goes viral. I, I assume it's more along those lines. AI created songs that are purporting to be from these artists. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, yeah. I think that what all Universal cares about is if anybody uses any song that is in any way uh, attached to an artist that we have signed, we want money. Give yes. us money. If you, you know, if you try to get around that and it seems close enough to the original song or even the artist, I mean, even the likeness of an artist, I mean, you yeah. get everything on TikTok these days. All of that stuff may be part of 
uh, something that goes forward and can, you know, this can, this can, if it ends up being a good partnership, mean how not only Universal, but other music studios, uh, uh, movie studios, you know, large, uh, large entities that represent a lot of artists work with platforms, not only TikTok, but the metas and the YouTubes yeah. and, 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 and YouTube, YouTube kind of set the template for this. It, it, the, the deals that they struck with content owners back in the day have essentially been the playbook that everybody has read from since what's interesting when it comes to AI is you have to wonder whether or not these kinds of deals and the leverage that the the content owners have will be eroded by the fact that AI music has begun to become, at least on a novelty level, popular. Uh, I would recommend anybody understand that it's very, very vulgar, but there is a TikTok account called Obscurest Vinyl, which uh, purports to find old songs, old novelty songs from the past that are, again, very vulgar, but they're catchy. <laughs> and they've become viral on TikTok. So in a world where that happens more and more, I wonder if a Universal Music Group is going to be able to strike the same deal that they did here. Yeah, yeah. As the U.S. versus Google trial winds down with closing arguments Thursday, details from the Department of Justice's antitrust lawsuit reveal that Google paid Apple, wait for it, $20 billion in 2022 for default search engine status in Safari. The DOJ accuses Google of using its size as an advantage to prevent competitors from entering the search market and how much it pays Apple is a big part of that. According to a report from Bloomberg, court documents revealed that Google indeed paid Apple 20 bu -bu -bu billion in 2022 <laughs> to be the default search engine on the platform. And that in 2020, Google's payments constituted 17.5% of Apple's operating income. Hachi machi, Sarah. Hachi machi, indeed. Uh, this is this is a uh, whether or not you think that Google uh, is abusing its power. It's certainly dominant um, in many respects. So let's break all of this down. But I I will say the 2020 2020 was. Um, very much a time where Apple was like on the up and up, you know, every quarterly earnings report like smashes records, you know, and you have like the Apple haters being like, this won't last forever, you know, and that, you know, and, you know, and, and Apple apologists being like, no, just a great company for 17.5 of Apple's operating income to be coming from Google because Google <laughs> wanted to have a piece of the pie. Um, I mean, hey, that's a great handshake agreement. Both companies yeah. highly benefiting from that. But, you know, that that's a little bit of a wake-up call as to how much uh, money can be transferred that would affect another company's bottom line at this level. Well, obviously, Apple and Google have had a complicated relationship. Uh, yeah. Uh, from Steve Jobs saying that Android was stolen product and threatening thermonuclear warfare to the relationship that Apple and Google had from the very beginning of the iPhone, which was tremendously beneficial. I think there's a few things that are interesting about this before we get into the antitrust element of it. Number one, that's a lot of money. Number two, I don't think Google is paying Apple an amount of money that would be more than let's say Microsoft would pay Apple to be this, the, the, the default search engine. I think that Google is paying Apple enough money so they don't invest their own money in search. Meaning Apple has to, to enough keep money Apple in, from doing it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. That that if if you are paying them enough that you can st you know forestall the idea that Apple would put the same amount of time, effort, and research into creating a search product like they allegedly and reportedly did for a car that they have then shuttered which was billions of dollars over the life cycle of, of 10 years, then you are, you are essentially protecting your market dominance because mobile search is so important. So I don't know how much this says that Google is in a dominant market position that would violate antitrust. But I do, uh, I think it, it says how much Google really, really, really relies on mobile search. And if they're going to rely on mobile search, you got to rely on Apple because a lot of people have iPhones. 
Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, yeah, I think I think one could argue. Well, hold on a second, Google. What about Android? You know, isn't Android the dominant uh, mobile OS worldwide? Answer is yes. But um, that iPhone search revenue uh, really comes in handy. You know, to to sort of break down that twenty billion dollars in twenty twenty two, think of that is as I mean, okay. So if you're saying over the course of a year. We're going to uh, Google, uh, we are going to be the um, dominant search uh, in mobile Safari um, and Safari in general, I believe. And so that comes down to just under $2 billion per month. That's almost $2 yeah. billion per. I mean, that is a lot. That's crazy. And I know, you know, there was a time where one billion dollars was like you're a unicorn that's crazy you know we're we're you know how how are we even you know throwing around money at the scale anymore not the case these days uh we're in a brave new world but for google to be and as far as i understand google and apple both very much did not want that number to be public it now is um, you know, that's how trials go sometimes yeah. um, and and information that is a par- part of a lawsuit. But yeah, of course they don't want people to know that because people go, wait a second. You know, there's no there's no underdog in this fight. Are you kidding no. me? There, there's absolutely no underdog, but it shows you how much AdWords makes. If that is something that they feel that they need to invest in their market space, it shows you how much Ad, AdWords is the, the the goose that continues to lay the golden eggs, although maybe a few less of them than they did in the past. But uh, uh, you know, $17 billion has got to come from somewhere. Google's not doing it as a charity case. They are doing it because they feel it is necessary to maintain the market saturation that allows them to make the kind of money that they do on essentially a uh, – product that cost them zero dollars to manufacture yeah 100 percent. if google didn't need apple it wouldn't need you know no <laughs> it would just say yeah b- bye see you never so uh <laughs> so that's yeah that's you know just just a little insight uh and and there may be uh some more details that come out of uh the us versus google trial um which is in closing arguments now so uh so yeah it's just uh, a lot of monies a lot of monies uh, a lot of AI also that we talk about on the show lately, uh, and 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 we love to talk about it on the show because it is a a sort of a wild west as far as the tech world. But if you want to go deeper into the latest in all things AI, you should really listen to AI Name the Show. Each week, Tristan Jutra and T- Tasia Custody wade through all the hype and the fud to keep you informed and know what is important and what is next. Catch it at AI Name the Show dot com. Back in February, Jan Kotanlem, co-founder of Glassview and a member of Paris School of Economics Board of Directors, wrote an opinion piece on the Financial Times titled, Why Europe is a Laggard in Tech. Now, <laughs> that's obviously going to get a lot of uh, tongues wagging. Uh, Koten Lem makes the argument that Europe is falling behind in the tech development relative to you, the U.S. and China. As an example, he states that investment in tech R&D is only one fifth of the amount that is churned out in the U.S. and half of what's in China. While in AI, the U.S. invests 50 times more than what Europe is investing in. These, these are, again, numbers from a couple of months ago. He identified the slower pace and expense of restructuring businesses due to tight, tighter labor uh, regulations as the primary culprit here. He also recommends labor protection laws for those salaried employees that make uh, above a certain level that allow the existing social welfare model to continue while giving companies more flexibility. Okay, Justin, I know that we talk a lot about how, um, you know, regulation in various, you know, uh, countries, blocks, states, uh, you know, what have you do do affect innovation um so so what do you think of 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 our um of our uh, opinion piece here i don't even think that the statement of the piece should be controversial europe is a laggard in tech compared to uh china and and the united states the larger more interesting question which i think that this article 
does a very good job of explaining is why. And to me, it boils down to a very simple bargain for which the leaders of Europe have made, which is that they would rather protect the stability of, of the market at the cost of innovation. And that's a decision. That is a labor-friendly decision that you have made to make sure that things don't change too fast. But if things are not going to change that fast, or if it's harder for things to change, then you're just creating a layer of risk on top of an already unpredictable world. So it should not be shocking that somebody wants to put in a bunch of money for something that might not happen in a world where, you know, even the best VCs invest in a hundred companies, hoping that three of them pay for everything else. Right. Right. Which often does work. Doesn't always yes. work, but sometimes you know, that is actually a strategy that people use. Um, it's, you know, it, it, yes. And, uh, if you are an entrepreneur or a, I don't know, venture capitalists um, in Europe, I suppose you have more restrictions as to, you know, how these things get pushed well, forward. Yeah. Well, one, one of the biggest things that, that uh, uh, the, the author points out is that it's very hard to fire people in the same kind of way that happens in America. And look, I, I am sympathetic to those that get fired in the tech industry. My wife got fired in the tech industry this year. It hasn't been fun. And the labor market is really, really tight right now. So it's hard for her to find another gig. Yeah. And at the same time, I know for a fact, when she does land another gig, it's going to be at a very high salary comparatively to a lot of other jobs because there is explosive innovation still in the world of technology and specifically with AI. So if, that is what happens here because of the system that we have. I don't think that it should be a, a controversial thing to say that a system that goes slower and protects and looks out for its workers in a different way, that this is a trade-off. This is a sliding scale. It doesn't make one way right or wrong. It just does make one faster and more chaotic and another slower but more stable. Yeah. So looking forward, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I would say I was about to say 20 years, but I mean, who even knows if we're all going to be around in 20 years. But looking forward, uh, knowing that innovation that has to be sort of like, you know, break things fast and work them out later type thing, yeah. which which many U.S. based companies have had issues with, but certainly started out that way, you know, what how does europe not benefit from the technology that is always global at this point well because it's not based there and if it's not based there then, then you are always going to be dealing with uh you know a a tentacle of a of 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 an empire and not the base of the empire now obviously there are some exceptions but without a doubt if you want to innovate you come to silicon valley and even the, yeah. the tech sector of like Beijing, for example, and, and TikTok, to its credit, out innovated Silicon Valley, but they did it by looking at what Silicon Valley was doing. They thought that the algorithm that uh, Facebook purported to have was more complicated than it was. And in the process, they made a better algorithm. So th that's that's just look, it, it is a speculative business. It is a high risk, high reward business and sometimes that means scaling up and down unfortunately really fast and if if what you want to do is prioritize the idea that uh, uh you know there will be protections for your workers uh, i think that that is a noble thought uh, uh, there's a lot of ink that has been spilled throughout the last you know a uh, hundred years beyond tech about exactly how well that ultimately benefits the populace but that is the choice that has been made that is something that they now have to wonder, Do should we roll some of this back or should we make exceptions in this field if we want to make sure that we do become more competitive in this world? I don't see it happening, but who knows? Europe, full of surprises. Well, if you have thoughts on this, and I know many of you will, uh, do send them our way. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Speaking of that, uh, let's check out the mailbag. 
So Doug in Michigan wrote in, he works uh, at a competitor of GMs and electrical systems architecture and I had feedback, good feedback, by the way, Doug, um, on our story yesterday about GM's Ultify CarPlay competitor. Doug says, you thought that GM was making a data play with Ultify, citing the idea if they use CarPlay, they wouldn't have access to information like things like how many miles you're driving, how fast you're going. This isn't likely to be true unless Apple has created some extremely different contracts than they have in the past. Speed, location, mileage, braking, steering, acceleration, all come from the car to the Apple device. And virtually all new vehicles have their own data modem to get info off of the vehicle independent of your phone. You already have access to any of that data based on whatever terms they have in place when you buy the car. Location is there because vehicles have emergency systems, et cetera, et cetera. Apple and Google get more information such as your preferences for media, and that certainly has value. However, it's more likely to me that Sarah's comments about rental cars hit closer to home for the story she talked about getting a rental and immediately having the same experience as she has with her own car. You're right, uh, Doug. I was talking about CarPlay. I love CarPlay for that reason. Doug says, Apple and Google want to take over the major user interface touch points in the vehicle, and the more they do that, the more the underlying vehicle becomes a commodity. Some buying segments that care about the vehicle per se, but there are a number of buyers now getting a box on wheels that they do to do their tasks. They aren't extremely loyal to one box versus another. My guess is that GM is making the long play to enable themselves to create a differentiated UI Identi uh, identity for their vehicles to increase stickiness with their buyers. Getting the extra usage data is a welcome bonus. Well, better be good. John Montana also wrote in the underlying platform that GM's vehicles currently run on is Android Automotive. Now that is different than Android Auto. It is directly controlling the infotainment while Android Auto and CarPlay are projections of a phone into the infotainment. Many manufacturers are using Android Automotive these days, including my 22 Silverado, and it absolutely supports both phone projection systems. The choice to not allow Android Auto or CarPlay is a fully GM choice. The Honda Prologue is a shared platform with the Blazer EV and runs Android Automotive with CarPlay and Android Auto. GM was recently caught selling driving data to LexisNexis. The opt-in was barely that sometimes not even agreed to by the buyer and definitely not advertised as can infect it can affect your insurance rates. I got my Lexus Nexus data and sure enough, it was pages and pages of my trips. I feel legitimately violated and I'm a typically pretty privacy focused person as a lifelong GM buyer who has bought their last GM vehicle. If they expand their plans to these ice vehicles, GM is no Apple. GM is choosing to make the experience worse for the sake of making a few bucks. I will take my dollars elsewhere before I buy a vehicle without CarPlay. You know, I always, <laughs> I, I, I don't like anyone being unhappy with their car experience, but mm -hmm. I love anytime a story of ours, and, and it, they often do, just strikes a nerve where we get these really thoughtful answers um, and just on the ground responses. You know, uh, Doug works in the industry. John, uh, you know, has, has a big stake in the GM game. This is great. This is great feedback. Thank you so much to everybody who, who sends great us- Great info. Uh, great, great yeah. info. Indeed, indeed. And and yeah, I think, I think both the points, uh, the overall points, that uh, Doug and John are making are, you know, GM, man, you're <laughs> you're gonna hurt the consumer by stripping out choice. But if you do that, at least have an alternative that works, which it does not yet. Well, you know what works? Justin Robert Young being on the show. Thank mm. you, Jerry. Uh, always a pleasure. Yeah. Let folks know what is going on with you. You've got you've got kind of a fun thing coming up. Oh, do I, for any DTNS listeners in the district, the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., the seat <laughs> of political power, May 24th, 7 p.m. at the Anacostia Art Center, myself, Jen Briney, and Andrew Heaton will, will bring our political panel show, We're Not Wrong, to the seat of American power. We're very, very thrilled to do it. Right now, as I look at my Eventbrite dashboard, there are about 10 tickets left. So if you want one, you better run, don't walk to Eventbrite. Search for We're Not Wrong, Washington, D.C., Anacostia Art Center, May 24th. 
Excellent. Patrons, uh, if you're a patron, Justin and I are going to be talking about rap music, but also um, <laughs> <laughs> also uh, retro Nokia phones. Uh, we've got a little something for everybody. Um, and you can stick around for the extended show Good Day Internet. If you are a patron, please do so. Also, reminder, we do... De- DTNS Live, Monday through Friday. Uh, we record it at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. That is a live show. It's fun to have you join along for the ride if you can. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash live is where you can find out more about that. We're back tomorrow talking about tech life in Antarctica with Craig Porter joining us. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand diamond club hopes you have enjoyed this program <laughs>